Hey, Larry, how are you tonight? Great, Andy. How are you? I am well. Had a busy, busy week with the family in town, and I'm pretty much wasted and a mountain of work to catch up on. Well, they were there for a week or so, right? Yeah, a week and a day. Which means you're you means you're exhausted. I am. I am totally exhausted. But you, I understand, are trying to teach your floor lesson. Well, I did. I did try, but I'm not sure the floor learned the lesson. Have you checked to see if it's indented from your iron palm? I would have to remove uh, old-fashioned carpeting to do that, but uh, I'm 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 dubious that there's any indentation. I think that's largely in my in my uh, palm. <laughs> the indentation is in your palm. I have a feeling that's where I'll find it. That's where I know it is. Uh, did, were you successful with the um, the intruder? I did. I did eradicate the cockroach after. Uh, Fracturing my wrist. Uh, yes, I did do that. Any profanity? Uh, well, at the time, yes, but I don't think we can repeat that on a family program. <laughs> Please consider making us part of your podcast diet. You can find us at Registry Matters on your smart speaker or podcast app of choice like Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. Also, if you like what you hear, please write a review. If you don't, eh, forget everything I just said. This show is supported by our patrons, and you guys and gals are amazing. You rock, and you guys are very much appreciated. Well, thank you to you guys that support us, every one of you. Yes, it is great. Uh, so this is a little disturbing. A lady on Twitter that I've been talking to, uh, her name is Beth, and she just says, excuse me for the family program, close your ears for a second. I'm sick of this shit. Psychologist threatens to kick my 20-year-old out of court-mandated counseling and refuses his attendance, which she knows will return him to prison. Why? Because my bank marked a payment to the psychologist as a potential fraudulent charge and denied one payment. I called the bank and they said everything had been cleared up. This is a psychologist that takes PayPal. Anyway, I asked if she'd been paid or if the money was denied to her. The bank assured me she was paid and nothing more needed to be done. This was uh, at the end of June. Then my son wakes me up at 9.30 at night on July 5th, showing me a string of nasty, rude text messages threatening to kick him out and telling him not to show up for his court-mandated group counseling. That she doesn't have time to play these games with him, and he'd better fix it. It was out of my account, and it's off her PayPal account, so he can't fix either one of them. He tried to explain to her that I had called the bank, and when I did call the bank on June 26th, I called her and left her a text message, and she refuses to communicate with me. He offered another debit card over the phone that night. She refused to take it. I'm not real sure what she wants him to do exactly since he cannot clear anything up with my bank account and her PayPal account and refuses to take other forms of payment and refuses to communicate with me when it's my checking account. That's the problem. This is a whole slew of just, it's just wrong. It's just wrong. It is, and it's one of those things about treatment that I have my long-standing dubiosity about. They recognize the enormous power that they hold because there's not that many providers out there that are, quote, approved. A person is not permitted to go seek counseling of their own in, in, in most circumstances and just submit. If you have a problem with uh, with most issues related to criminality, uh, the the treatment is is mostly open. You can you can approach your supervising officer and say I've gone to X Y and Z, and with proof of attendance, that's sufficient to satisfy. But in this area, the 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 providers are approved from a narrow list, and and I happen to believe that the criteria is not as pure as the wind driven snow. I think it's more about who will cooperate, and what I call is a collaborative fishing expedition. It's tragic. I hope they're doing all the things that, that you can do, and that's to protect themselves by documentation, documentation. That I'm trying to pay you and having a, a what we call a paper trail in the old days. We now call electronic record. Make sure that they have preservation uh, and keep it professional. It's like a divorce lawyer. A good one will tell you when you're communicating these days, you should expect everything to become an exhibit potentially at trial. Don't get ugly. Be professional and document that I'm trying to pay you if that if that payment that was rejected has not been made, make sure it gets made if you have to resort to an old fashioned check. I mean I know that would be beneath many people's dignity, but do what it takes 
and document that everything is in, in good standing with the treatment uh, provider. Don't you think that electronic records like a bank credit card or some other form of online payment would be sufficient as well? Well, if it, if it processed through to, 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 to the provider's account, but right. if, if it did not process through, I, I tend to want to leave no stone unturned. I, yeah. was, I was at Wendy's the other day and a person uh, uh, was irritated because their, their point of sale system was down. They could only process orders paying cash. And he had a loud card. He made enough noise to wake up the dead and almost T-boned the, uh, the oncoming traffic leaving the parking lot because he was angry that the, that the point of sale system was down. Well, he would have no reason to be angry. If he had a $5 bill in his pocket, he could have paid for his purchase. These are nice systems, but you still can take an old-fashioned check in. I know it's beneath your dignity, but you can do that. And you can write an old-fashioned letter, and you can send it with certificate of mailing by certified mail. You can do a number of things to preserve a record. And a certificate of mailing, most people don't know, is different th than a certified mail. And we're going on to uh, <laughs> Postal 101. But there's a certificate of mailing that will document that you mail something on a certain date. You fill out this little white paper. The post office stamps it after they match up the return of the, and the addressee. And they hand it back to you and charge you $1.40. And you've got proof that you mail something. Right. And the person doesn't know that you actually took any per special precautions until, until you need for them to know that you can prove you mail something to them. And that, short of it being a certified letter, that just then, I, I'm assuming then that would be admissible to some type of court, Judge Wapner, people's court, and when you're saying that this is uh, the situation? If, you, if you're taking the position that I did mail her payment to replace the one that was stopped, just putting drop it in with a 50 cent stamp is yeah. not proof. But if you drop it in with a 50 cent stamp on it and the certificate of mailing addressed to the treatment provider that's been endorsed by the post office saying that you did mail that, it's a lot more convincing. Sure. And then it's just on the post office of whether it got there or not. And I mean, yeah, not, and, and we know 99.9% .9 of all mail gets through. Right. Yeah. I was just, I mean, there is still the chance that it doesn't get through, but by far and large, they do make it in. It's just, it's, they, they do hold enormous power. The, uh, the treatment providers. And I think I've mentioned before a friend of mine, he was doing his treatment and it was right around the holidays. He was making barely above minimum wage, nine-ish bucks an hour. He's working a manual labor job. This is a guy that's in his late 40s at the time, and he's paying 23% child support money, and the treatment provider says that he has to take a poly, so he's got to fork out 225 250 the whatever the number is. And uh, he's like, I don't have it. And she says, well, I'm going to drop you from class, and that'll be a probation violation, and you'll go back to prison. It's like, what? I, how are you supposed to manage that kind of life he was fortunate, like his PO allowed him to have a one month extension and let him take it the following month. He turns around and he title pawns his car. He just had some, you know, 1975 Pontiac that he could get for a few hundred bucks or something just to have some wheels around town. And so fortunately, he was able to title pawn that to pay for a polygraph. I mean, that's garbage. It is. And the tragic thing is that without being able to repay the, 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 uh -huh. the pawn shop, he runs the risk of losing his vehicle, which would render him incompetent, incompetent, incapable, excuse yeah. me, incapable of engaging in further employment. And the same th thing with this individual that Beth describes. Very few people at 20 years old are, are, are any type of uh, earnings capacity. They're, uh, they're, they're beginning their working career. Yeah, He's not likely earning very much, and that's why she's helping. And you would think that the, the treatment provider would say, well, in, in a – if I was dealing with a 44-year-old, I would expect them to be paying me directly. But I guess I may have to deal with mom because this is a person that's still really in their beginning stages of life. Uh, you wonder what the, how these people uh, sleep with themselves uh, to, to, to have such a harsh attitude about, about, about situations. Do you think they actually sit there and think that they are helping society be safer by, by keeping these evil people off the street? I think that 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 they might think that, but I think that their moral just their their, their moral compass is missing. They, they 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 just don't don't have a concern for for people. They're able to not able to to relate to the situation this person's in. Uh, it's 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 incomprehensible to me. But yeah. Beth, keep doing the keep doing the documentation. Uh, if a push comes to shove, and if it's a probation, that means that, that potentially you're going to be seeing a judge if there was a violation alleged, and make sure that there's adequate documentation 
for the judge that that this issue was was everything was done to remedy it, and that that it's them not allowing him to participate in class uh, in treatment. It's not him refusing to participate. Don't let them cast the the picture that he's refusing to show up. Right, right. Unlike someone we know who said, "I'm not taking this sex offender class stuff." Yes, well, well, uh, I would have shown up anyway, even if I got a text saying don't show up. Uh, Certainly, I would, uh, I would, I would still show up. But that's and, what the court ordered me to do. And make sure you're like taking pictures uh, or you know documenting that you were there, even though that you get refused, so that you say that I was there and it's not a he said she said. Well, you document the refusal to admit you. You send you send a, 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 a say. I was, I, I'm, unfortunately, I was not able to comply with my treatment obligation today because you refused my admission, and mm. you, you make you create a record of that. And depending on the state, you could possibly do an audio recording and you don't have to tell anybody, but depending on the state, you might have to get permission saying, Hey, I'm recording this. Do you consent? Uh, just to have an audio recording of the refusal. That would be great if that were permitted. Uh, sometimes they do these in probation offices and they confiscate everybody's electronics as they enter probation offices. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that it's, it's problematic to get electronics in, in all supervision offices because they're afraid of that very thing. But this is course, the treatment provider though. This isn't, um, well, that's what I'm saying here in New Mexico, they did the treatment in the probation offices. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So you had to go through screening as if you were seeing your PO. Now that model has broken down now because they're doing field-based supervision. But for years you went to the probation office for the, for the uh, so-called treatment and, and you got screened. It's like you're going to see your PO. And, and not to beat a dead horse, but the guy that I went to was a PhD and there were people there that, uh, could not afford it. And he would like, can you pay something? Can you pay five bucks? Can you, hey, and if you couldn't pay, he just let it slide. It seemed from his attitude that he was interested in the actual treatment, not the monetary side of it. And it sounds like uh, Beth's treatment person is 100% about the dollar figures. It does appear that way based on, on the, on the message. Uh, I always, always consider that there might be another a chapter that we're not hearing because we're only hearing one side. Certainly. It certainly, certainly sounds very, very harsh. Mm -hmm. Well, let's move on. And uh, this is coming out of uh, Davidson County, North Carolina from WFMY news uh, from school safety, uh, from school safety to neighborhood safety, SROs, uh, school resource officers help track sex offenders. We've got some audio. Have you ever wondered what school resource officers do when school is out for the summer? You'd certainly be surprised. WFMY News 2's Jansen Silvers found out many of them are keeping your kids safe in other ways. Right off the bat, they're keeping the kids safe in other ways. You got these people that hang out at the schools and they're, I guess these are kind of like the, uh, the hired people that if there's some situation at the school that they uh, can uh, call 911 or whatever, they're more... Uh, on the ground to to provide services that way. So what do they do for the three months of summer vacation? They're unemployed? Apparently not. <laughs> so they've been recruited to go out and go check down, uh, make sure that the uh, registrants in the area are being compliant and living where they say they're living. But you've already, you've already told them where you live you already know that it's a felony to not live there. If you, if you decide to go move in with your girlfriend without telling anybody, uh, I don't, I don't really see the need of them doing this specifically during the summer, unless it's just a money grab, just to justify giving a handful of people extra jobs. That would be, that would be my guess. I did a little before the podcast, I did a quick uh, check of Davidson County because I don't know North Carolina as well as uh, one of our leaders does. But it, the county seat is Lexington, and it, the population is 164,000, roughly. And uh, it, it appears to be off Interstate 85. But I would imagine that from what our, our state leader has told me in North Carolina, that the sheriffs have just realized that they have a play toy that they can use, and that's to go out and, and verify the residency, uh, the, the com compliance checks. They, that there's, there's funding available to do compliance checks, and I suspect that this is a creation to get some of that federal money to do the compliance checks that's available as a result of the SORNA component of the Adam Walsh Act. That's my suspicion. And, and uh, it's kind of like when I was a young man, we, I worked in schools uh, as part of a youth employment program. And the teachers that wanted to could have summertime employment doing the same thing we did 
rehabbing the schools. And a few teachers took that opportunity and came worked with us to rehab the building. <laughs> so I suspect this is a is a, is a is an opportunity presented itself. The sheriff can can deputize these people and put them on the payroll and use uh, federal and state grants to pay for for the compliance checks. That would that would be my guess. I I don't. I don't want to be the guy that sits here and tries to count somebody else's money or justify somebody else's job, but it doesn't seem like it would be that hard to do that. You couldn't do 10 or 20 a day. It doesn't seem like it's much more than knocking on a door, seeing if the person's there. If not, they could just be out to dinner and you come back. I mean, it just, it just doesn't seem like it would be that hard to do to verify the compliance of somebody. If they are, if they're where they said they are and all of a sudden a church school or daycare moved into the area and you're within the thousand foot restrictions, you don't have to go visit the place to know that that app we talked about an episode or two ago, that would tell you. Well, I'm not a believer that the compliance checks are for anything other than, than uh, continued. Uh, it's a, it's a harassed power. It's a demonstration of power. They, if they were trying to be, uh, merely for compliance, they would not need to come out in large teams. They would not to be, need to be heavily armed. Uh, they would not need to show up in, in the swarms of people they do. Th- th- this is not about compliance. It's about it's about minimizing the person's exist- existence and making sure that you maximize the exposure of outing them. And they do it in the most aggressive way in most jurisdictions. I've heard of occasionally of, 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 of good law enforcement officers that they have departmental policies that make it very, very low key. And those are to be commended. But the funny thing is, you're not required to do it to start with in many states. There are a few states where it is required that, that, the, that the sheriffs and law enforcement are urged or even required to do a, a verification. But in many cases, it's an invention because it sells well to us, the public. If they go out and say, we're checking on these creepers and keeping you safe, they don't get phone calls saying, we object to that. They get phone calls saying, thank you for doing that. Now, do you think they're going to do <laughs> less of it when they get phone calls saying thank you, or do you think they're going to do more of it? They're so they're responding. They're reflecting, they're reflecting our values as a public. Um, are they creating it or are they reflecting it? I think they're, I think they're reflecting it. <laughs> I don't think they're creating it. You don't, it seems like it would almost be a supply and demand. They possibly did it. They got good feedback about it. The news covers it and they get applause for it. And so then that just justifies that they did it. And it justifies more of it. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And, and, and as long as you elect sheriffs and most around the country, that, that is the way of which they hold their offices. Uh, their, their deputies are, are oftentimes a tool of their reelection campaign. Yeah. What they do is uh, re-election numbers and, and how they choose to allocate those resources. They consider those factors. And as I say so many times, I don't make the rules for life. I'm just telling you what they are. Yeah. And, and the fact of the matter is when we elect sheriffs and we elect prosecutors, we act as if we're surprised when they do what we want done. Here's another clip. We have 347. That may not sound many when you got a whole county, but that's a lot of sex offenders for, for our guys to check. Um, and and the, I check them all year round, but the SROs check specifically during the summer. 347 sex offenders living throughout Davidson County. That's why Davidson, along with Guilford and Rockingham counties, recruit some of their school resource officers to help check in on sex offenders and make sure they are where they say they are. Because sometimes they'll move without letting deputies know. They might they might lie about where they live or where they live might be within one of those restricted areas. All those violations are felonies. It's just like you said, it's just it's just some sort of program to set up to literally just find you the minute you have crossed the line and then lock you back up for something that they could just nudge you back in line and uh, rectify it without putting you back behind bars. Oh, that is that is correct. But it's interesting that they talk about the they lie. They lie because of barriers that you have erected. That, that prevents them from telling you the truth. There's sometimes a family member that would say, yes, I would be happy to have you, but I don't want my house on the registry. I've heard of too many vandals. Right. I've, heard of, I've heard of murders. I've heard of this. Uh, I, I don't want my property value to plummet or whatever the case may be. 
I want to support you and I want to be, I want to be, uh, but I, I, I can't have my address on the registry. So the person is faced with being homeless because of rules that you've made, or they have to see how long they can fly under the radar without, without putting that particular address on the public website. Right. If you would take your damn website down, you'd find out that compliance would actually go up. Yeah, there wouldn't be nearly as much a uh, conflict of having your information out there. Employers would, they at least wouldn't be de-incentivized, disincentivized to to hire you because their information gets put out there. It would benefit. Uh, it, 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 the, the 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 registry public notification of employment and 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 the, of course that would not eradicate the barriers a thousand feet that they're right. talking about with all these things, but. There would be there would be people who would be able to take folks in. I kind of feel that way myself. I, I I'm somewhat open minded, but I don't want my house on the registry. Sure, certainly. <laughs> I, I, when when they when they launch a lot of the Molotov cocktail through, they're not going to be able to isolate it just to the part of the house that I'm not in. <laughs> Let's move on. Sheriff warns of scam against sex offenders. Scammers are calling registered Maine sex offenders, claiming to be law enforcement and demanding they pay a fine using a gift card. This is from the PressHerald.com. And this is a, sort of a teaser. This happened to come up on my radar just on its own, that at least one jurisdiction is telling the public, telling our people that these things might be going on. But this also leads into a Narsaw phone call that we're going to have a little joint venture with because this is an independent production of Narsaw that uh, we're going to join up and try and expose as much uh, expose the content to as many people as possible about this scam that's going on with the with our folks. That is correct, Andy, and thank you for bringing registry matters uh, into the uh, to the mix on the on the phone call. Where uh, for July nineteenth, there'll be more to come. I think the first announcement will go out tomorrow, but let's give kudos to Cumberland County, Maine, uh, for 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 this. The uh, people listed in the deputy Daniel Graham and Sergeant Jim Goskin and Sheriff's Captain Don Goulet. Thank you for 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 alerting people to that. Some some law enforcement agencies tend to take this scam very lightly, and we appreciate. In fact, I may reach out to that department and find out if they have any comment or wish to be a part of the of the podcast. But we're going to try to reach as many people as we possibly can and arm them with information. In fact, we're going to reach out to the national organizations uh, uh, that, that that advocate for sex uh, sexual offenders uh, and try to, to see if we can figure out some joint collaboration collaboration project to 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 nip this or at least to diminish this effectiveness of this. It's, it's lack of information. Nobody, if you, if you have a chance to think about it rationally, you're not going to run pay for a, a warrant on a gift card, but, but people are doing it. They're paying thousands, thousands of dollars. Uh, uh, but you get woken up, up at 10 o'clock at night and, and, and someone tells you that we're going to come out and arrest you. And they know your name and they know, they know the names of, of legitimate law enforcement people that work in your department where you are. Uh, it's very it's very uh convincing it, it's like the rs the rs has more money than we'll ever have in terms of being able to reach people with public service announcements and people still fall victim to phony rs examiners demanding payment and the rs never calls you and demands a payment they send you a letter and they demand payment that way but but uh, we're not going to reach everybody but we're going to reach what we can and we're going to do what we can to try to let people know and, and we appreciate registry matters joining up in the project so I guess the way that it's going to be is not quite a live recording of this podcast, but you and I are going to co-host the show and there will be people calling in. It's going to be over on the quote unquote, like the Narsal platform. It'll get streamed out to YouTube and people can call into the typical conference call number that has been, has been used, but you know, and then also the show would get released as a podcast on the Narsal side of things uh, in the coming weeks after the uh, recording, after the uh, call occurs. But we're going to try and get the information out to everybody. This is just ridiculous. This is just people being preyed upon. And uh, it's just, but so one of the things that I want to, maybe we should wait until the phone call though, is these people are quote unquote impersonating officers. So isn't that a crime on its own? Forget the extortion part. It it, it is. And that's, that's one of the enticing uh, features about prosecution. The problem is that they're difficult to identify. They right. operate uh, sometimes offshore, sometimes in other states. They use spoofing technology to, yeah. 
to mask their identity of their of their call. So they'll spoof and they'll use the agency that they're claiming to represent, and you'll recognize the number. They'll put in an area code and the general phone number for 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 a law enforcement agency using spoof technology, and they're very convincing. So yes, it is against the law, and that's the reason why law enforcement. And it, and it may end up being that, that it'll require more federal resources if they're operating from out of state, from beyond the, the reach of the state authorities. So if Virginia is calling South Carolina, then it could go federal? It very well could. Cool. Well, so that's going to be on July 19th. We wanted to push the call out far enough so that this could get out and reach people. This will be released uh, tomorrow night, which is what, the 9th? Yes, July 9th is when uh, this will go out at 11 o'clock tomorrow night. But that'll give you plenty of time to put that on your schedule for the following Thursday. The next article is from the Connecticut Law Tribune. Lawmakers missed an opportunity to reform sex offender registry. The section that I clipped out is very different than what you captured. And the part that I captured was after two years of study, these changes would have resulted in a smaller, more focused and enforceable registry. Also, they would lessen the barriers to offenders successful reintegration into the community. The 204 page report was adopted by the full sentencing commission and submitted to the judiciary commission committee, excuse me, of the legislature in December of 2017. But you had a completely different angle. Well, I did, and I, I agree with what you what you uh, clipped out. And, and, and what? Let me say again, I don't make the rules. I just simply relay what they are. What happened, and I'm not even in Connecticut, but I can tell you what happened from experience. You've got a, a commission giving a report to legislature saying downsize the registry, make these reforms. There, th- there was an immense amount of fear that set in when 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 that when when it was going to be dumped on their lap to do that. And there's nothing that scares a politician more than than the, the than the uh, wrath of public opinion going against them, which means they're trying to figure out a way to insulate themselves and be able to blame someone else if they if they make a, a reform. And they 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 created this 40 member commission to do what had already been done by the sentencing commission, but the sentencing commission apparently was not heavily weighted enough in favor of the law enforcement. So if we can find the section here about who they put on the 40 member commission. I got it uh, here. It's the subcommittee had representation from all of the stakeholders, including state and local police, state attorney's okay, office. That's, that's, let's go through each one of those. It's law enforcement. Okay. State and local police, obviously the attorney's office, corrections, parole, judiciary, and then we move into victims advocates. Okay. So the only one that has any appearance of neutrality would be the judiciary. Okay. Of all the people that are on that, well, what would you think that when you have a, a commission weighted that heavily in favor of law enforcement, would you expect you would get something good for the sex offenders or not so good as a final recommendation? But aren't they the ones on the front line trying to have like getting these people back in the community and they see that we're not a threat from the recidivism rate? Wouldn't they be in our camp? The, you think the police and the prosecuting attorneys and the victims advocates would be in our camp? Really? You know, you know I'm jerking your chain. <laughs> considering that there's like a, pol- a corrections officers lobby in California and they would lobby for tougher sentences so that they can keep their jobs. No, I don't think that they would be in our camp. Well, that that's where this, this process apparently broke down. Uh, it, I'm not clear because I didn't follow house bill five, five, seven, eight, which was uh, a, a, apparently there that would have created a new board to evaluate sex offenders risk of reoffending and go to some sort of risk-based model. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a risky thing politically, and uh, politicians need cover when they're doing things that are risky because very few politicians run on the campaign that if I get an office, I'm going to try to make things better for sex offenders. You have other things if you're running for state office that you want to do. You may care about senior affairs. You may care about children and, 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 and K-12 through education. You may care about environmental things. But very few, very few people run on the platform that they've spent their life studying the issue of sex offenses. <laughs> and this is what we're going to – I'm going to make – Ma got elected to the state senate. I'm going to reform the sex offender registry. She's going to bake a cake for you. <laughs> and, and I tell people that about about people who work in the in the correctional system in prisons, and and there are good people working in prisons. So please don't send a whole bunch of comments saying that there's not good people. There are, but when's the last time you've heard someone say, "Ma, I can't wait to graduate from college. I want to work in a jailhouse." Right. 
NASA, I mean, NASA wasn't hiring that week. That's how they ended up working corrections. I mean, that's not what people aspire with the greatest talents to do, which means we end up with people working in the correctional system that, that are not top tier. But there are some very nice people who care and, have, and have, have good qualities. But that's not where the best people gravitate to. Um, we've talked about this. I'm trying to remember how I worded it, but don't we lose by default because, and, and Cindy's up there. So I don't think that we were just left unrepresented entirely, but generally speaking, when these kind of things may come down the pike, none of our people, any of our advocates are in the house trying to testify and give any sort of credence and support that this is the right direction to move. Well, that is that is correct, and in this uh, in this uh, committee that they formed, you notice it didn't say uh, the, the the sex offender advocacy group. Now, if I had been there in Connecticut, I would have said things that would make people throw stones at me. I'd say, "Well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We're not here at the table. This is a civil regulatory scheme, and we're as the regulated individuals, we don't get to be at the table. Well, you don't do that to the oil industry." You don't do that to anybody else. You don't do that to the lodgers when you think about the, uh, raising the hotel lodging tax. Any type of regulatory scheme on restaurants where you're going to increase the requirements, the regulated always has. You don't do. Why are we not at the table if this is a regulatory scheme? And, and of we course, are the ones. Say, we are the ones affected by it. <laughs> and, and of course, our people resent saying that because they don't want. And I say, well, say it because you win both ways. If they say it's not a regulatory scheme, you say, well, thank you for going on record and clarifying that and use that in litigation. And if they say it is a regulatory scheme, they say, well, then why are we not at the table? Right. You win either way. Sure. That's that's one of the beauties of your skill set is it, it almost seems like we should start a segment and kind of come up with a, a battery of the arguments that people will present to us. And you are then our coach and tutor on the responses, the replies to those challenges. Well, it's a civil regulatory scheme. Well, great. Why can't we be represented? Oh, it's not, it's a, it's not a civil regulatory scheme. Oh, so you're saying it's punishment, then it's unconstitutional. Right. We, well, but, but that re- requires unorthodox thinking. Certainly. But you're pretty unorthodox just given <laughs> the way you are. <laughs> and it, it is difficult to, it's difficult to say those words because you know. And I know that almost all of our 50 state regulatory schemes, so-called, are very punitive. Right. Which means you have to hold your nose and say that. But when it suits your purposes, you say it. Of course. Because it further you move the you move the ball towards the goal line. Mm-hmm. I want to be at the table. And if you say I can't be at the table, tell me why, and tell me another regulated group that's not allowed to be at the table. The telephone companies get to be at the table. Tell me one other I, thing in there, though. You, um, why, if it's not civil regulatory, why wouldn't we be allowed at the table? Well, the, very, very rarely do do people who are suffering the brunt of punishment get to decide to be at the table. In terms of, I think they should be, but it's it, the the victims. The victims clearly have been. Society has evolved that victims get to have a, a say-so in punishment. I disagree with that. But again, I don't make the rules. I'm just simply relaying what they are. Victims have been have been relegated and delegated the responsibility of deciding punishment. I consider that vigilante justice. Certainly. But nonetheless, victims get to be at the table in terms of the uh, 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 debate about how lengthy the sentences should be and what the punishment sh- sh- should look like. But the punishment has ended for people who have timed out their punishment and they've served their debt to society. The regulatory scheme is beyond your reach. Right. What, what claim do you have to participate? You're not the regulated entity. Now, I don't mind you sitting back in the room and this is a public meeting and you can, you can, you can, you can make a comment, but, but we should not cater to you and what you think about the regulatory scheme because this is not a part of what, <laughs> I mean, by, by default, we're, we've allowed them in. I, I know when Maryland had uh, w- the lawsuit, the, the two Doe cases, and ultimately when the, the state's highest court said you're going to have to remove these people, they created a way to make sure that the victims were notified about their removal. Well, what the hell does the victims have to say about it? The court has determined that the law is unconstitutional. Right. It doesn't matter what the victims think about whether they can be on the registry or not. But it was a way of delaying the removal. Yeah. We need to be saying, "Hey, victims, you're 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 not in this part of the game." Sorry, that's very going to be very popular with the victims' advocates. I'm going to have a hit on me before long. <laughs> and and something we covered earlier is the victims are out of the equation when 
the gavel goes down and say innocent or guilty? Well, not necessarily, because if there's a parole violation, they, they've now got themselves into to, to, to uh, if, if there's consideration for parole, for meritorious parole, like if a person has to serve a fixed amount of their time and then they're eligible to be released before the end of their sentence, they get to they get to hear from the victims again about how horrible this person would be if they were out in the community. So it doesn't necessarily end when the gavel goes down. But my position is it ends when the punishment ends. Okay, fair. I don't All want right. to I don't want to invite them into the non punitive civil regulatory scheme. <laughs> the non punitive one, right? <laughs> the one that if you fail to comply you go to jail. I mean I mean I I, I guess other people like if if they set up the regulations of how much a fisherman can can pull out of the ocean and they violate that they can go serve prison for that right they can so isn't that a civil regulatory scheme it is uh, well well it can be uh, th- 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 those are also criminal acts when you when you when you but but there are civil regulatory people get confused about that failure to comply with a civil regulatory scheme can result in incarceration you can fail to have a driver's license and right. you can go to jail for that. Right. Uh, and, and, uh, the, 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 so, so you can't just look at that. But what you can look at is the disproportionate resources we spend on this regulatory scheme versus others. I can't think of any that will send you to prison for the years that a, that a, that a failure to fill out paperwork and timely notify will. Normally, if you don't f- comply with your business license requirements and you're out of date, there's there might be a reinstatement fee. Yeah, uh, but 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 in terms of in most regulatory schemes, the penalties are going to be very uh, much reduced from the penalties for this regulatory scheme, which argues for that it really is not so so non-punitive because we would treat it much more lightly, at, like we do other civil regulatory schemes. So the restaurant, you can get shut down and you can get put in prison right. if you're if you're not in compliance if you continue to disregard public safety. But it's not like you didn't pay your taxes this month. And they shut you down. You have to continue to do that and avoid them and say, F you, I'm not paying and all that before they eventually come in and shut you down. But it's like you haven't done that. You miss it by one day and they literally came in overnight and bulldozed your building. That, that would be a good analogy. And that, that they're salivating in the case of this regulatory scheme. They're salivating. They're sitting there with stopwatches practically waiting. They've got people in tickler files if they use such things anymore. But they have people in files that come up so that they can watch you on your 90th day for your update. Yeah, and they're down at the they're down at the courthouse with an affidavit for an arrest warrant. Jesus, and they're ready to to devote manpower to going out and picking you up. That's just it's just unbelievable. Let's move on to the uh, the the way fun article of the week. This one wins all kinds of awards for being creepy, and I just I can't figure out how we get to this level. But from uh, Muskegon, Michigan, Muskegon, 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 Michigan. Man's prison-made drawings of child sex acts qualify as pornography, says the court. This guy's already serving time for child sex acts, and he draws, uh, you know, the way the article reads is he drew them, a fake character that he has made up, and there is sexual activity going on with an adult. Somehow the corrections officers find it, and he ends up with an additional seven years in prison. I see the creepy factor. I see that it would get, uh, he would get disciplined in prison. Maybe he goes to the hole, goes segregation. Maybe he loses store privileges, phone call privileges. Maybe he loses things like that. I can't figure out how you get across the line to actually charge the guy. I don't see who the victim is. This is totally, to me, this is totally thought crime. It may be, Andy, and I apologize to the listeners. I did not get the opportunity to, to read this case. So we, I'd like to bring it back up again next week on the next episode if we possibly can. Well, now you're signing me and, homework. And, and, and I, will, I, will, I will make an endeavor to read the, the opinion of the appeals court. This has been appealed to the Intermediate Court of, uh, of Appeals in Michigan, uh, which, which, which without me reading the case, I can't determine if they enhanced his sentence that he was serving or if they – brought brand new criminal charges against him and for he got the additional time, uh, which makes me hesitant to comment. But I can say unequivocally that he may have a First Amendment issue, which he could take into federal court once he exhausted the state, uh, his, his state appeal. If he doesn't get any traction with the Michigan uh, court system, he's got the Supreme Court left uh, in, his, his, in his arsenal of where he can go. But this is something where he might would get some uh, assistance cons- uh, considering it's a First Amendment claim 
from the ACLU possibly. And the ACLU of Michigan has been quite active, and 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 they did the uh, the representation on Smith versus Doe with the with a clinical law program of I forgot which university, but the the, the this this the, what's been created in his mind, and what he put on paper is his right to express himself. Yeah, and 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 now I think there's the case law is not favorable in terms of computer generated images. There's some that's not so favorable, but what you draw is is your is your personal art. And I think that this case may not be over yet. Uh, I, I think there's there's life left in it, and, and uh, he, he may end up getting this extra time set aside. There were some interesting comments. Uh, one of them is uh, somebody wrote, says, maybe it's a midget. Maybe it's a mythical being that lives to be a thousand years old and ages in reverse. Maybe it's a resident of Alabama in 1899 when there was no age of consent. Maybe it lives on the planet Tralfaz 7, where the age of consent is 7. Since it's a figment of the draw's imagination, all it would take for any of these conditions to be true is his own say-so. Well, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up next week and I'll, I'll, read, the, I'll read the decision, but I'm, I'm troubled and, and I'm, I'm hoping that, that uh, we're, 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 in, we're in dangerous territory now when a person can't draw something. Let me ask you one other question about this, though. How is this any different than someone penning a story about mass murder? Pick any crime that you want. How is it any it's something in your brain? You know, I mean, Stephen King has has created really horrific stories, you know, like Misery is one of them with uh, Kathy Bates, who played in the movie, just doing these horrific things. Why doesn't he get brought up on charges of a thought crime of, you know, kidnapping and all of the. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, aggravated assault kind of things that Kathy Bates did to her victim in that movie. What's the difference? I'm I'm unclear on the difference, uh, and, and that that's what troubles me because I don't know how they've distinguished this in, in an institutional setting. The, the the institutions are afforded broad broad latitude in terms of keeping institutional safety and security, which means that that this could be deemed contraband and not able to be possessed by an inmate. But that's different than sentencing them to additional time for it. Right. Uh, that's a different, different than a new crime. They can, they can, they can practically prohibit almost everything except religious uh, and even some religious stuff, depending on what, mm-hmm. but they have great, great latitude to keep institutional, uh, institutional security. But this appears to be beyond that, so it's very it's very troubling, and I'm gonna I'm gonna endeavor to read the, the right. appeal court decision and, and see if we can uh, get some clarity on the next on the next episode. And this is from one of our friends, Steve Yoder, uh, from the publication called The Appeal. Why sex offender registries keep growing even as sexual violence rates falls. It's a it's a really cool article. There's a nice map that is uh, laid out as far as I mean, if the information is accurate. But you have a state like Florida. And at the conference a couple weeks ago, I was talking to Gail Coletta. I had no idea. If you visit Florida and you cross the threshold of having to register, then you never come off the registry there. Or you could be dead and you stay on the registry in Florida. So the way the the numbers for the National Center for whatever it is, uh, Missing and Exploited Children. Missing and Exploited Children. Nick Nick, Nick. um, They report that there's about 900,000 people on the registry now but the rates of offense are falling, then it seems that the way the registries in these various states are tracking people is to inflate it, giving the public a further false sense of security that well, we have, or I, I guess not really even sense of security, a sense of fear that there are all these people on the registry, but they might have already finished their sentence. They may have, um, they may be dead. They may be, have visited and moved on. So there's a whole lot of misaccounting going on. There's, there's a lot of that, and I say that to, to, to the chagrin of our followers. 900,000 is an inflated number because you have much du- duplication. And the Nick, this article, Nick admits that. They don't, they don't have any way of distinguishing the duplicates. Right. When they add up the total, that's the grand sum of the total. They don't have any way of distinguishing easily how many people are in prison and who are not out uh, uh, lurking as they would consider in the community. We don't have 900,000, but we have an awful lot of people on the registry. If it's 600,000, 700,000, or whatever it is, it's a huge number. And the more important point is that we're adding more people that are coming off, even though the offense rates are dropping. But that shouldn't surprise you. 
We've been doing that for 25 years that the crime rate in America has been falling. We've been increasing our prison population exponentially. Right. Uh, but this map, if, if, uh, if, if, if this can go out to the, to the uh, listeners, I think they would, I think they would benefit from it because you look at the, they, they rated the, the, the number of registrants by a hundred thousand population, like they do the number of murders, the number of violent crimes. That's, that's a typical measurement. That way you have consistency. And you look at the states that have the lowest number versus the state that has the highest number. And the typical thing I tell people about in the South, if you look where the largest <laughs> number is, let's see, Florida at 350. Mississippi Texas. at 348, Texas at 350, Louisiana. I can't see that number there for Louisiana. Oh, 204. That's surprisingly low. Look for, up Tennessee. For, for look at Tennessee. Uh, oh, wait. Ten- and then look at Arkansas. Arkansas looks like the winner. Uh, uh, Tennessee at 434. Then you get to my more liberal state, 179. You go to Maryland, which is a more liberal state. You got 120. Now, Maryland, that number would have been much higher, but for all the people that have been there, they, uh, thousands have come off as a result of the Doe decisions. District of Columbia, 169. What's, I mean, up, with, uh, what's up with Oregon, though? Oregon's a, a left-leaning state. Why are they at 679? That, that, that is an anomaly with, with Oregon. They're very tough on crime in Oregon. They, okay. they, 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 they have a very high prison population. They're, 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 they're way up there. Uh, and I would have to understand more about the politics of Oregon. But, but you look at this map, Wyoming, 408. South Dakota, 419. Uh, but you, you know, go to it, go it, over it, on the other side, and you go to Massachusetts and Connecticut, and they're in the 150 range. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I don't make these up, boys and girls. I'm just telling you what they are. They, the the numbers reflect the very harsh attitudes in these states. And uh, and Indiana surprises me, only 149, yeah. and Ohio only 158. Now I'm not surprised about Ohio because Ohio has been a more progressive state, but Indiana has been conservative for a long time, and and their numbers are now they also had a decision back. Uh, almost a decade ago that uh, limited a lot of what they could do. They had a court decision from the United Supreme Court, the uh, Wallace versus uh, state versus Wallace, I believe it was, or the other way around. But, but yeah, this, this map tells a horrible picture about how, how the states put as many people as they can on the registry. Mm-hmm. Arizona is surprisingly low at 199. And then uh, American Samoa is eight. <laughs> Uh, yeah, though. No. So, well, I, I, I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't, I don't see any. I'm not surprised about it with the, with the declining crime. We've, we've sure. had an ever increasing number, because law enforcement tend, continues to expand its influence, and very, very few, very few people work in law enforcement come and say we need fewer of us because crime is dropping. Right. Would, can anybody tell me when they've heard that? And, and, you know, and they're writing laws that are retroactive and pull somebody that got convicted of something in 1960 and then ropes them in, even though they finished their sentence 30 years before the registry kicked in. Tragic. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registry matters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. This next article comes from the Washington Post. Judge laments 40-year sentence for meth dealer as excessive and wrong. This one's interesting in that the guy, uh, he just kind of ends up down a bad path. He grew up with a religious background. He grew up a Mormon in Utah, and he ends up getting roped into drugs and alcohol. And I, th- I think the way that I read the article is that just through his own usage, then he needs to kind of support the habit. So then he becomes a meth dealer and he ends up hanging with all the wrong dudes. And they, it seems like they kind of tricked him into being a dealer for him, sort of, so to speak. And I think he had like a 10 year minimum sentence. And then they tacked on a 15 and a 25 or something to give him that extra time. It's really, it's a, he's never going to see the light of day. 
well, I, I'm the one that put this article in here, and it doesn't exactly connect with, but it does, and I'll, yeah. I'll explain why. The uh, I'm big about elections have consequences, and, and, and what I wanted to illustrate here was a couple of points with this article. We've got a senior federal judge in the state of Virginia appointed by a conservative president named Ronald Reagan. Uh, judge uh, Judge uh, T, I think that stands for Thomas. I think it's Judge Thomas Ellis. Uh, uh, let me double check that. But Judge Judge uh, Judge Thomas Ellis has 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 asked the federal prosecutor to please don't do this to this guy. Find a way that could give him the opportunity to get out of prison. Now, under the previous administration, that's exactly what they were doing. Is they were they were instructing the prosecutors the U.S. attorneys, which is who the judge is talking to, saying, saying, please don't do this. The judge is asking that, begging that. The, the former Justice Department under the previous president had ordered that they not seek these maximum penalties. This They did a, they did a complete reversal. The Department of Justice under this president has ordered that they seek the maximum enhancements and the maximum penalties, which means that this guy, if 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 the U.S. attorney, the assistant U.S. attorney for that district in Virginia, seeks the follows his boss's instructions, this guy will never see the light of day again. And we've got a conservative judge appointed by a conservative president saying this is excessive and, un, and unreasonable. We elected the president on the platform he ran on to be tough and law and order. And this is a consequence of what we're getting. Now, this don't only, does not only apply to drug offenders. This will be people who are possessing images. They will seek the maximum for the images. So all of you start calling us and saying, my poor grandson, he only had seven images and they gave him 22 years or whatever it is, 100, they actually send us in months in the federal system. They gave him 194 months. I'm going to say this is what was elected in 2016. There's no bait and switch. This is what was promised. This is what's being delivered. That's why I put this in here. But but it helps us to look at even how we change our definition of what's considered uh, considered moderate. This judge at the time he was appointed, I can assure you, was not thought to be a liberal. Judge right. Thomas Selby Ellis III, when he was appointed in 1987, wasn't thought to be a liberal by any means. But he's saying this is over the top. Right. And and, it, and we're, we're, we're now faced with a vacancy of the Supreme Court. We're trying to figure out what a liberal is. We, we, we look back uh, over the decades of how what's considered moderate has evolved because the extremes have gone so far out to the, to, to the right. When John Paul Stevens was appointed to replace the, the retiring liberal William O. Douglas back in 75, it was all – all the fears were that that was going to move the court alert to the right. Well – uh, John Paul Stevens, after he retired 35 years later, <laughs> he was thought to be a member of the liberal wing of the court. Right. I heard because about that. Every, everything had moved so far to the right. Well, that's where we are. And the, the point is the election that we just – this is the result. Elections have consequences. If you're not happy with maximum penalties being sought and people not getting out of prison for the rest of their life, remember that when you vote next time. There's a uh, clo almost closing uh, paragraph. It says there have been bipartisan efforts in Congress to soften mandatory minimum sentences, but they have been met with intense opposition from Attorney General Jeff Sessions, where former Attorney General Eric Holder instructed prosecutors to avoid charging certain defendants with offenses that would trigger long mandatory sentences. Sessions has told them to pers pursue the most severe penalties. Well, that's what I just referenced, that that was an order that went out early in the Trump administration yeah. to seek all the enhancements, to file the career enhancements, to do everything you can to maximize people's time. And they've also cut out the exit process. They've cut funding for reentry for the for the six months in the halfway house. So people are getting two months, three months or even no halfway house to reenter, which is going to lead to more failures on the supervised release portion because they're not having that six months period to gather their finances and to reintegrate uh, in a more structured environment to learn how to live in the community again. It's all a disaster. But like I say, I'm just pointing out, folks, elections have enormous consequences. This is one of them. Um, I think I was we were talking about it in a previous episode where Trump was so far out of the norm as far as he like 
listed here are the 20 people that I would nominate to the uh, Supreme Court if given that opportunity. And he was walking into having that open seat where nobody else has really ever published that kind of information. Maybe because he did that, all the people, regardless of whether he grabbed their hoo-hoo or the things that he did that seemed to be outside of the norms of anything that a conservative person would be interested in. But because of SCOTUS, that is why he got elected. And because of that, then he appoints all these other administrative people and we get Jeff Sessions out of the deal, who is he that's a horrible individual. I have nothing, nothing good that I could ever say about Jeff Sessions. Well, you don't tell the good folks in our uh, state of Alabama uh, that because he's uh, he's a scary, scary human. For the, he's for the, very for, beloved. Yep. He's very beloved in Alabama. Well, for the guy that um, wouldn't join the KKK because they smoked pot, not because of their other stances, uh, that that's crossed a line for me. Uh, it, it, well, and then the president's had uh, regrets about appointing him because he recused himself on the special prosecutor, and he's been very critical of Sessions. But Sessions enjoys a lot of support because he was a former senator for so right. long, right. and he has a lot of support in the Senate. So he's not going anywhere. No. He's going to have this job of attorney general. He's going to be like uh, Janet Reno was for Clinton. Clinton uh, was not amused by Reno, but he, he ended up being stuck with her. And uh, that's kind of what it is with uh, Sessions. It's got to make a major blunder before he's going to be fired. And yeah. it's got to be big. Yeah. Not like Scott Pruitt. That was Those were pretty big blunders. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we did get some good news, and we are going to go around our elbow and around our high knee to get uh, I think I screwed that up. Uh, anyway, the jobs report. Uh, this is coming from the from the Guardian. June jobs report. Trade wars yet have to have impact on employment rate rises. So last month, the U.S. added 213,000 jobs. And if I'm not mistaken, there needs to be about 150,000 jobs created every month just to keep up with population growth, people turning 18, immigration, except, uh, and so forth. And 213 is a, is, a, is a decent number. And so how many months in a row have we had good job growth, positive job growth? Uh, 93 now. So, so that would include the, the 18 months of the Trump administration and about uh, six years of the Obama administration where we've had significant job growth. And how long was Obama in office? He was in office for uh, would be 96 months for, uh, for, for uh, eight years. Huh. Okay. So for almost his entire time, he had, uh, there was, there was positive job numbers, but to relate it to our people, what do you think, what would, what would a low unemployment number and, you know, employers are starting to talk about having to raise rates to uh, recruit employees. What would such good job numbers mean for our people? Well, that's, that's why I put this in here because I'm optimistic that, that employers are going to begin to look at felons. The way it works is 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 that the you you you've got chronic labor you've got acute and chronic labor shortages depending on where you're in the country right now. You have had since about 2016, particularly in construction trades. Uh, they've been they've been hampered in their productivity for two or three years now because of the the, the acute labor shortages that they're, they're they're experiencing, which means that. That that uh, we're, 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 our economy is not even as productive as it could be if we had the workers out there that that could do these jobs. If you don't have skilled workers to do building, you have trouble building. If you don't have people that know how to uh, to engage in those crafts, uh, oh, so we we got shortages in that. We got shortage significant shortages in service industries, particular hospitality and food, and then we've got high tech shortages of, of where where they need those special visas to get people in here that have skills that are just in short supply. And I'm not able to explain that. Perhaps you can explain that one better in terms of the of the tech needs. But we've got we've got these labor shortages. Well, the employers are having to figure out they need bodies. They either have to figure out how to automate their jobs or they've got to figure out where to find them, which means they're dipping into the senior population. They're getting a lot of people that had thought that they would be retired. They're luring them back in the workforce and giving them flexible schedules. Uh, then the next the next rowing after seniors is more young people are working, more minorities. We've, we've pulled the minority unemployment rate down to historic, near historic if not historic lows. Well, what's left, Andy? What's left is people with fel felony records and with felony cr criminal and felony records, then the least desirable is going to be people on the, with, with, with sexual felonies as far as an employer is concerned. Right. But when you're needing warm bodies, you're going to start making some tolerances and exceptions. So I'm hoping that more of our people that are out living in the woods and under bridges 
can find their way into the workforce through job fairs and through through assistance to get back into the workforce and be productive citizens. I got to think that at the height of the recession in like around 2010 or so that our people getting a job would have been really hard because there were people that had master's degree that are like flipping burgers at Waffle House or something like that because there's just nothing else that they can get themselves into. But whereas now, you know, we're, we're close to full uh, f- full employment. Uh, there's still some gaps in some places, but just it just seems all around like it would be good for everybody, but our people specifically. Well, that's that's my optimistic view. Is I'm hoping that it pans out with 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 evidence that that that, that is in fact happening. But if you're needing bodies right now, our people there's a big job fair. One of our state senators puts on a job fair every year. I'm going to encourage as many people in New Mexico to go to that job fair that can get to it if you're unemployed because their employers going to be there begging for workers. They're looking at you. You come in dressed nicely and have a resume that shows you have some skills and if you're willing to work. I'm optimistic that you may even find a job even despite the fact that you have to register. And, and and that's that's good that's good news, but this economy's been in recovery mode for a long time. We're, we we've 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 not just started this in the last eighteen months. We've no, been, and we've been been on a trajectory of two hundred thousand, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand jobs for the last six six years before this administration took office. And it's funny that there was no compliments, none coming from the right wing about how, about how it's great to see the economy recovering. But on the very first day that the new administration came in, the very first job report, those numbers quit being phony, and they all of a sudden are great numbers. And and, and that's what disturbs me because it's so intellectually dishonest. The, the workforce participation rate, which is another measurement that became all important during the previous administration, it's inched up fractionally, not a full percentage point. The number of the total population of working age is in the low 62 percent range. But that is not going to inch up significantly because older people don't work. They're, they've, they're at the end of their career. So you're not going to have – you're not going to lure the people that are 65 to 85 back into the workforce in significant large numbers. Right. <laughs> but but it, there has been an inching up of the workforce participation rate. But these numbers have been good for some time. Our economy has been in recovery mode for some time. The stock market tripled in the previous administration from its low points. And for, for, for that, nobody gave any credit. And, and that's that's disappointing to me. Uh, I'll give this administration credit where credit's due, but, but but they have not they have not brought this recovery on by themselves. I did read a funny little clip that when Obama took office, the stock market was what in the 7,000s and left, you know, he tripled it or it tripled during his administration. And to have the same numbers. So when Trump took office, it was 19 ish or something like that. It would have to be in the high 40s or in the 50s for it to have the yes. same kind of triple yeah. growth. Well, well, a lot of people don't understand the stock market if you're not an investor. They look at the uh, 1,000 points at it, but 1,000 points is a percentage of the total. Mm-hmm. So if you take the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is the most common 30 stocks, which those those companies rotate through the through the ages as, as our economy changes and evolves, uh, companies are moved and companies are added. But if you take that index and you look at the 1970 – uh, index where it was less than a thousand. Well, if you took the Dow to two thousand, that's a hundred percent increase. Mm-hmm. But if you take the Dow from eighteen thousand to get a hundred percent increase, you have to go to thirty six thousand. Yep. But they look at it. Well, we're up three thousand points, four thousand points since Trump. But on a percentage basis, which is how you measure this, when when Obama took office, the Dow was on a, a skid that had been on all the year of two thousand eight, and it bottomed within two weeks in the six thousand range. And by the time he left office, it was at eighteen thousand, which was a tripling. Mm-hmm. But but uh, but they don't see it that way. They say, well, it's up it's up five thousand points uh, roughly since Trump's been in office. But on a percentage basis, that's only twenty something percent. Right. And that's not three hundred percent. Certainly. But but I'm happy to see the stock market doing well. It's been kind of it's kind of stagnant for the last uh, uh, several months. Maybe yes. the, the entire year 2017, it's been in a trading range. But but these are all good things for 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 us. If there are people who are on the registry who have investments, it's good for the stock market to do well. There are people on the registry that need work, so more jobs being created is good. There's a point going to come, in my view, that we're going to be forced with so much automation because we just don't have the workers out there. And companies are going to have to figure out how to get the work done, which is going to be more and more automation. Yep. I'm in favor of it. Bring on the uh, scripts and the robots. Well, but I, 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 I'd like to pose a question. When we do that, our models for funding senior citizens' benefits are based on workers. Are you going to be able to get the 
people who have a robot that's working 24 hours a day to pay the, the Social Security and Medicare taxes that would have been paid by the workers who would have been doing those same jobs. If we can figure out a model to fund our programs that are dependent upon, I'm all for as much automation as possible. But I don't know how we're going to fund the models that we've worked from now depend on workers to, to support retirees. If we don't have enough workers, the retirees will suffer. Sure. I, I, and just shooting from the hip, I don't, I haven't necessarily heard this from anybody. Figure out what the actual output is of the, the, the device doing the work, whether that device is a human or a robot and charge tax based on that. Well, you're going to get a little in, uh, uh, opposition from companies. Companies Absolutely. already don't don't feel like they should pay any tax. That's what the I big know. tax cut was that, that that took the corporate rate down to 21. percent They say that they should not be taxed at all. Right. Convincing a company that's invested millions of dollars in robotics that they're going to have to pay tax based on the production of that is going to be a tough sell. Yeah. Uh, but 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 it it the funding model for senior citizens benefits is the current workers are paying the benefits. Those checks and those electronic payments that are streaming out to current recipients are being paid by current workers plus the supplement from the trust funds that have accumulated. The trust funds will exhaust themselves by 2033 or so, and then it'll be the revenue that's being generated alone. And if we don't have workers, the the, the, the benefit programs will suffer, and I don't know how we will fund them without changing the models. Yeah. I completely understand. I don't, I don't know any way, you, you know, there, there has to be a certain amount of money in to have the money go out. And if we don't have the money coming in, how do you have the money go out? And that's what the, uh, that's what the, the, the budget shortfalls always end up to be. Well, what you do, Andy, is you cut taxes and the, the revenue skyrockets. That's the solution. I, I think I can see how that works, but has it been proven to work yet? It has not. But, That's but we keep trying. We supply keep trying. side economics. <laughs> it, it, revenues do go up under every administration. So to say that, that, that revenues did not go up when there's been tax cuts, the economy grows over a four and eight year period. Yeah. Usually, usually there's recovery in the economy. So revenues are generally higher. But the rate of growth of revenues as a result of these tax cuts, the, the, the rate of revenues uh, growth has not kept pace with, with what the revenue growth was before the tax cuts. But, but people – People believe wholeheartedly that, that, that you can balance your way out of the budget by cutting taxes and combining dramatic spending increases like they're doing right now. And, and, and the deficit is ballooning right now and but, nobody talks about it anymore. But to be fair, you can't tax 100 percent and make that work either. There has to be some sort of window of the bottom end and the top end of what would be effective. Absolutely. Uh, during the, uh, the the post World War II time, we had a top t- a marginal rate of ninety percent under Eisenhower. That was that was ridiculous. We had a top marginal rate of seventy percent when Reagan came into office. That was too high. But we're down in the thirties now. We we're we're not talking about those astronomically high rates any longer. But yes, there is a point where you, where you can suppress economic act- activity. There's no doubt about that. But, uh, but Very few people are going to go work if they're going to turn over nine, 90 cents on every dollar. But that's not, I was just going to, add, that's not exactly how it works. You don't pay 90, if you make $10,000, you aren't in the 90% bracket. You don't lose 90% of your money and end up only taking home a thousand bucks anyway. Everybody is taxed at the same rate through those different bands when you reach whatever it is, $250,000 a year. Then you would hit that top band and that money would be taxed at that rate. That is correct, but you've got a lot of people who make yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. gobs more than two hundred fifty thousand. Certainly, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't get near that level. I never know exactly where those levels are, where you get that top rate. But we're talking about top rates uh, under under the uh, 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 post Reagan. We're talking about top rates in the thirties, not not anywhere near the seventies or nineties. And, and and that's uh, it is difficult to. To think that a person who's still going to keep seventy cents on the dollar is going to say, "Well, if, if, if I can't get keep one hundred percent of this, I'm not going to I'm not going to want any more money." That that's just to me a little bit absurd. Yeah, I hear you. Well, we tried to cut it short, um, and we are probably at an hour and ten minutes or so, and I think we have covered it all. How can well, we? What was, our, what was I what? was going to say? What was what, what? What was our topic this week? Well, the topic to me was the. Uh, <laughs> Well, it was everything, of course, but part of <laughs> most of it was to plug the uh, the mm-hmm. upcoming phone call. The other big news to me was that the jobs report just being being good, so kind of just something tangentially related to our to our issue. That was to me the the biggest uh, topic for the night. I I I, I think so as well, and I'm I'm going to really stress to people that if you're looking for for a job, this is a great time to be in the job market. 
it's not a panacea because having a felony erection, uh, conviction <laughs> record uh, and having a conviction for this is not is not going to be an easy street. But employers are desperate right now, and and doors are doors are going to be open that weren't open last year, the year before, or five years ago. Uh, so so this is this is great news. Um, in terms of our joint production, uh, I thought you were going to. I thought Red Street Matters was going to stream it live also. Uh, I. It's going to get streamed to YouTube on the Narsal side. I don't see any reason to okay, double, double okay, stream so, it. So, so. Okay. Uh, so, well, to put you on the spot, how can people get in touch with us? Very carefully, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, pretty please with sugar on top. If you know people that this information would be benefited by, please share the podcast with them so we can get our numbers to continue to grow. We've been hitting kind of like record numbers lately. Uh, and uh, we can continue to receive a lot of positive feedback, but you can visit us at registrymatters.co. Please call and leave voicemail, 747-227-4477. It's not a phone number I, I plan on answering anytime soon, but it's a way for you can uh, can leave a voicemail message. If you want to shoot us an email message, go to, uh, send one to registrymatterscast at gmail.com. And if you want to enter into the all-star phase, you can support us at patreon.com slash registry matters. I, w- I had closed my page and I was trying to find where those numbers and that information was. Uh, so I'm glad you got that out there. I, I had jumped away from that. I see. And I appreciate very, very carefully. Yes. That's how they contact us. Of course. Very carefully. Thanks all for listening. And I hope you all have a good night. And as always, Larry, thank you very much. My pleasure. Good night, Andy. Talk to you soon. Bye.